Yeah. 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 Ye
it's part of being willfully ignorant. That's, right. That's, you, you have to come up with crazy reasons why it's never going to work. There's nothing yeah. I can do to prove it. I can't do these experiments. Other people have to. So I say you could feel your first sorry for his family uh, and, and friends that lost a friend. Um, but what a waste of life. Yeah. To I spend your time in, in, in pursuit of willful ignorance. I, yeah, I agree. That's the saddest part about it is the, I think that if he had dedicated that much energy towards something worthwhile, he could have made a much bigger impact on the world. And, oh, well, that's, that's just one sad little thing that I wanted to, um, to mention, because I do think it is actually a loss to the sort of pseudoscience debunking community, because he was at least someone who, while he was spouting nonsense pseudoscience... He was at least someone who could do it in a personable way and who wasn't just sure. impossible to talk to. Um, and yeah, he put his money where his mouth is, and there's, there's something to be said for that. It's perhaps foolish, and I think it was foolish to strap himself into his own homemade rocket, but anyway, let's talk about stars. Sure. Stars are, are, are you might, some people might say they're, they're cool, but actually they're, they're quite hot uh, and a pretty hot topic. They're certainly an important constituency in our universe, and they're actually a lot more complex than um, most people might uh, might presume. Um, we've uh, even scientists, you know, in, for, through the centuries, have sort of wondered about stars. Um, there were some fairly daring people early on who postulated that um, stars were like the sun, that the sun was a star um, and the other points of light. M you know, in, in a lot of in ancient times, the sun was seen as one of the orbs in the sky and stars were things on, on the... Right, it was originally counted as on one the of the, the seven planets along with the moon, right? Because those yeah. are the things that wander against the fixed background stars. Yes, yes. So the notion that, that the sun was a star and stars are just suns but far away was something. Now, you know, people... People like uh, Giordano Bruno, or even you know, later on, uh, people such as as Newton, you know, speculated about um, the stellar properties of that. And there were, actually were even Greeks who um, attempt you know, who postulated that stars were were the sun. And um, one one philosopher sort of designed this experiment where he said, "Well, let's take a star that seems to have a similar color." to the sun um the sun is mentioned white right it's not yellow right if you, if you if you take a a a white surface and shine put it on the sunlight you don't see yellow you see white right right um it only looks yellow Yellow happens to be one of the predominant predominant colors right uh that 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 we see in in, in this little spectrum of of wavelengths it seems to peak around in, at the yellow due to its ter surface temperature but um but the but the but what, so this, this person said, well, here's a star. And I believe, I believe they might have picked um, either Arcturus or maybe, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I, I forget which star it is. Maybe it was Arcturus, but they picked a star like that. Or maybe it was, I think it was me, it was Vega. And they said, well, let's see how small of a hole we could put into a, a, a I think it was maybe a, a block of wood or masonry so that when we put it in front of the sun and, and shrink the sun down to a small pinpoint, that spot is as bright as the star was at night. And so they would go back and forth making these holes until we basically, they calculated that if they reduce the sun's light by, you know, by a, a, a significant fraction, you know, by, by, by putting, you know, putting a basically a very narrow point, they could say that the sun was this much brighter than um, the star. Let's say it's Vega. That is a clever and experiment. So they then uh, and and then they went back and forth, you know, doing experiments on there and carefully drilling this hole, making this thing be able to get wider to the point where they were able to calculate the relative brightness, apparent the apparent brightness between the sun and Vega. And they they also did experiments with with lanterns. And, and sort of uh, observe, you know, the inverse square law, that that when the lantern was twice as far away, it appeared to be four times 
fainter, right? And so they then came back and they said that Vega must be this many times farther away than the sun is. They didn't know how far away the sun was, but they could estimate. And actually their estimate was uh, within about 25, 30% of modern I mean, I would uh, say, values. heck, getting within like 40% is pretty impressive when you're <laughs> using a board with a drill. I mean... <laughs> Or whatever they did for, for that for that set, but that was kind of a and so um, I'm sure it was somebody who was wealthy enough. It may it may have been able to use they may have actually used metal plates. Now I'm thinking about it, um, and be able to fill it, get a hole that they could span and contract to get this notion. And then I say, but but they also then use other people to go and see, look at the sun for the pinpoint, and then look at the star back and forth um, over day and night, and and say, yeah, that was appears to be about the same. And so they got this estimate. Now they they knew they 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 knew that the sun was farther away than the moon because of eclipses, right? Um, or they presumed it was mostly far away, farther away, and so they then made this estimate that how great the power of the sun is, this star must be this much farther. Um, I don't know if they did it for other stars, but it was again a fairly clever uh, means. That is of... that is really cool, and actually, uh, Vega is one of the objects that. Um we observed through the uh one of the telescopes on mount lemon outside of tucson uh ben tobin and i went up there uh, a few mm. months ago and um one of the interesting things about it was that when we observed it uh, our sun was still very much up in the sky because with yeah. a decent telescope vega is not that hard to observe during the daytime yes um and and uh but i'll try to move slower for the person that <laughs> i'm feeding me the the chat so i will just to see what you're saying but i'll try to move a bit slower um the the i think i think as i say that 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 there's actually a number of objects you can see in the in the daytime and with a with a carefully uh, a careful use of a telescope you can you know, observe things like jupiter and so forth in in the, in the daytime um, the risk, of course, is that uh, if you're not careful, you can get, you know, you can do damage to your eye or damage to the scope or damage to objects nearby because of reflecting, yeah. the sun reflecting. So you may be pointing, you know, 45 degrees away from the sun, but if you've got a, a telescope with an open mirror, the telescope, the light that comes on the side will bounce off of it and focus to another spot. Right. Um, outside and and catch something on fire or burn somebody or so forth. so you, you have to be really really careful of using that thing nevertheless um there are other times where you can look at um objects safely we for example in antarctica uh it was about 80 degrees uh and 90 degrees uh, south latitude um, we used a small um you know we, we were able to see um sirius uh in the you know, um, on the, you know, near the horizon. Right. Uh, and, and you could see it visually if you knew what you were looking for. Um, and then with a small binoculars or a spotting telescope, you can actually see the, the, that it was actually the star. So, so you can see stuff in the daytime. It's just, um, most people have probably seen the moon. Yes. I think that's the most common one. In fact, that's one of those common flat earth bafflers. There's actually um, a YouTuber, Brainy Beaver, and he has a segment called How Come Moon, in which he goes on about people being utterly confused by the very ordinary behavior of the moon. Yeah. But something as simple as, as looking, at, looking at the rotation of Jupiter and, and, and seeing Jupiter rotate, because it only takes 10 hours to, yeah. to turn around. And so you can, over a, a long winter night, watch Jupiter go through a full rotation. And you can see the fact that this orb is is is, is turning right, and that not them, and that that if you've got a, got a reasonable telescope, you can see features, um, uh, uh, basically um, features that are that are of the same uh, same longitude, um, and 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 move across Jupiter, and then half rotation rate appear back on the other side. So you can tell that this 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 Jupiter is a is a sphere that's 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 turning. You can just see it, right? Right. You don't have to go up and rock it. <laughs> In fact, so, if you can identify the great red spot, it's a nice little landmark. Although it's shrinking, yeah. so someday, someday that won't be an option. But maybe a new storm will appear that'll be similarly. Yeah. Distinct. And, and there's, there's a number of white ovals and other things too that that are there, and and, and it's not 
uh, actually get through the red spot is not clear what that that storm's duration is uh we know that it's been there for at least you know at least 300 years right and um it's it is faded right i can you know when i was a kid it was it was definitely red and now it's kind of a more pale orangey thing and it's also smaller in, in size uh, but whether this is just a a, a phase that's going through or it's a storm that's fading um dream remain to be seen we know from the juno probe the probe that's orbiting jupiter and actually an extraordinary probe that actually is able to withstand the intense radiation near jupiter's surface that uh the the red spot storm has a thermal signature that goes deep into the interior of of jupiter it's not just a surface thing it, oh, it, wow. it, it has we can tell from from thermal signatures that it goes at least 40 percent into the the cloud surface that is so a, it's, it's, that's a gigantic a, feature yes and so that might say that that perhaps what's happening is we're, we're having um surface uh uh convection issues but that the storm appears to still be be rooted now um how long the storm has been there um more details exact cause or something we're trying to figure out so you're right it could it could someday um you know fade into oblivion but uh we shall see i my big thing is i feel like it probably will just because i feel like things tend not to be permanent especially when they're made out of flowing gas sure but sure. then and, again maybe there's some underlying cause that goes even farther down and maybe there's some kind of thing going on, on the surface that we have no clue about and by surface i guess i mean like whatever liquid or solid maybe yeah way down at the core because there's there's going to be something that is the sort of the core around which all this gas ended up falling it's not just gas the whole way down well again um juno the juno probe is orbiting jupiter is has given us a really good mass density distribution um inside inside uh, jupiter um because of it, how it orbits right that the, the jupiter is not a point source there it's actually a distributed mass and we can tell by by how the probe moves you know moves around in its highly elliptic orbit the the density gradients and the the given the densities that we see there is a solid rocky core and above that is a pressure where again jupiter is mostly hydrogen and helium right um where we presume the pressure and temperatures are sufficient to create something called metallic hydrogen where hydrogen is pressed into a form where it turns into a metal and it has weird 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 properties um and and above that is likely a liquid helium zone and uh but 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 because also of the the liquid helium helps create this enormous magnetic uh dynamo inside and there is also a period where there's probably uh, a convection um, area of liquid helium three which has weird properties and and then there's probably an area where there's uranium helium and all kinds of crazy sort of stuff so so down deep jupiter has some rather odd features that that are um you know very difficult if not impossible to uh nearly impossible to try to even recreate in the in the lab people have been trying to make metallic hydrogen and there's been reported attempts that they might have been successful but i've read some um, of those yeah but it was very hard to confirm yeah so so anyway um but but large glassy bodies like jupiter are actually fairly tame compared with for example what something happens in like, like a star uh, a star has um, a number of, of of properties. I mean, most of of when when scientists you know started thinking about stars and how they shine, um, I think for example it was Kelvin, uh, the Lord Kelvin, that um, speculated. He, he didn't under he did not know about you know nuclear processes, and so he looked at uh, what would be the the slowest burning or slowest chemical reaction that could create heat and and speculated that the sun was probably i mean i think there's estimates he said he's several hundred million years old right that that it was kind of limited in size given that they at that point knew the distance of the sun and size of the sun to a within a you know a few percent they sort of said well given a chemical process how long could the sun 
remain warm. And uh, that's what Kelvin put in these uh, estimates of several hundred million years. Until, of course, they had understood um, um, nuclear nuclear fusion, nuclear processes. Right. Uh, and that, of course, yeah, ended up explaining right. why sun. But but uh, he did we, have, we have we have this. Go ahead. Oh, he okay. he did. Uh, Lord Kelvin did a similar calculation, uh, trying to uh, assess uh, things like geothermal heat and how old the Earth could have been. Yeah. And he came up with similar numbers, but of course, again, it was th their problem was uh, he didn't know about uh, nuclear processes because nuclear fission is the heat source for most of the Earth's internal heat. Um, and so, but he still, he, it was interesting because he made the assumption that, okay, well, let's just assume that the Earth starts as just a ball of, you know, molten rock, essentially. And it's at the, about the same temperature that, you know, you get when you have like a, a lava eruption from a volcano. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, I mean, it's a pretty good assumption. And at one point that does roughly characterize what the Earth was like. It's just that there were processes he didn't know about generating heat in both cases. Sure. And, and so in the case of the Earth, um, you, know, you have two things that are were, 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 were function. One is the, the heat of formation, right? When you take... If, if our model of how planets form are reasonably correct, then what happens is you get little planetesimals, little, little small blobs that um, begin to accumulate. You get a larger blob that gravitationally attracts smaller blobs to it and sort of builds up. It's like a like a rolling dust bunny through a to, to a dust lane and it begins <laughs> to attract stuff. Oh no, dust bunnies on on under your bed do it by rolling around and and, and picking up stuff. But these through the orbits and and through the gravitational attraction begin to lump things together and you'll get several competing blobs in a similar orbit and they will eventually collide and merge to form a um a larger blob and it's sort of how planets secrete and there's a whole actually there's a lot more details to how they go from small dust to blobules to large planetesimals to a planet but all that stuff ends up becoming um um you know forms forms a planet now those blobs coming together and, and colliding, and collapsing generate heat. So we can talk about and actually you know, calculate the amount of energy that comes from forming a planet. Stuff coming together just doesn't gently there. It, it's, it's, it's major bombardments and huge blobs hitting things and, and, and generating lots of heat. So part of Earth's early heat was from the formation. Right. The other part was from radioactive material. And uh, the decay, uh, for example, in Earth of, of things like uranium and thorium and, and even um, elements that, that had shorter half-lives dominated uh, the, the you know, Earth's heat, early heat, heat core. And, and where did those radioactive elements come from? Well, they came from a star that went supernova. And in fact, our model, if our model of how the solar system formed is reasonably correct, then... About 4.8 billion years ago, you had a massive star that that went with, underwent a uh, supernova. And then you had another massive star 4.7 billion years ago, 100 million years later, um, that went supernova. The first one, 4.8 billion years ago, sent out a shock wave that hit a gas cloud that was, you know, gas cloud like you would see in the Orion Nebula. Um, by gas cloud, and, and I mean a cloud that's that's has is mostly hydrogen but is very very tenuous i mean it, it's it would be thinner than what you can build in a vacuum chamber here on earth nevertheless when that shock wave went through it it compressed gas and created a lump and then more hydrogen started piling up on that lump because of, of, of gravitational attraction it you know the mass built up and and you got at the center um, you started getting conditions to fuse hydrogen. And that's where, you know, the, the sun, as they call it, switched on. Um, but that that shock wave included the heavy elements that were generated by the death of that of that first star. Because that's one of the things that, that these massive stars do um, when they go supernova is they generate the really heavy elements. So we, you know, that the, the, the take as a notion that we are all stardust, right? That, that, that most of the elements that are not hydrogen in your body um, came from um, some sort of you know stellar-like explosion, such as a supernova. Right. So the first one hit 
hit the shot, hit, hit the gas cloud where the sun began to form. And about a hundred million years later, when you had a nodule and some of the heavy elements just stuck around in, 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 in a rotating gas cloud, it got hit again by a second supernova. Um, and so it already was fairly dense. And so we got a good chunk of, of those materials that stuck. Um, and the combination of those two gave us the materials that form the rocky, you know, uh, uh, rocky metallic, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, the lighter Mars, not enough stuff for the asteroid belt and the cores of Jupiter and, and, and Saturn. Um, so those processes of stars going bang are quite important to create planets. Nice. So thank but, you, stars, for dying for us. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like the equivalent of a, in, a, in a forest of a large tree falling in the forest, um, the death of a, of a large old tree. As it as it falls, it rips the canopy up and 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 creates this sort of hole as it goes, you know, smashing other trees as it falls. Right. And and what that what that does is it puts nutrients in the ground. It creates a place where sunlight reaches the ground. And so the sproutlings, you know, basically race up and, and yeah. fill the void. You so you get a, a cycle of life that way. And same thing with stars. Right? We, we talk about stars having populations, uh, although it's, it's, they do it sort of backwards where the, the, the population one stars are like our sun. Those, those two supernovae 14, 14, 7 billion years ago, were population two stars and the and the first stars that formed after the big bang were population three right uh so so you've had these sort of cycles of, of stuff nevertheless um most you know stars that are that are really really big like betelgeuse um last only a short amount of time uh and and they go through a process they go through processes that are very some you know very different than our sun because our sun doesn't have the mass to do certain things. But let's talk about the structure of a star. I mean, what what what's inside a, a star? Uh, and our our models um, that are backed up by experimental evidence say that in the very interior is where fusion occurs, where 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 you have a process, let's say, of hydrogen fusing to form you know process of of you know of of deuterium helium three and helium four that happens inside that's that's the fusion the nuclear core and for stars like our sun um there is a there, there there's a the way that it sort of works is that that there's a around the core is a radiative zone where where essentially um heat from the core due to radiation is is transmitted outwards by by essentially um um radiative uh, uh processes above that radiation zone is a convection zone where where instead it's the it's a turbulence of the outer layers that that reach the the surface when the surface is a spot where gravity can't you know uh gravity wins and 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 keeps the star from expanding because without gravity that that uh core would blow itself apart gravity keeps it in and keeps the pressure on it and so the surface of the star is where it goes from being transparent, you can see past it, to translucent. There's enough gravitational material to hold the plasma down in that spot. So, so again, for the sun, you have to have a core. And you know, typically inside that core is around you know, 14, like our sun's about 14.5 million um, Kelvin. And then when you start drop, you move out of the core into radius zone, you're about 2.1 million Kelvin. And when you move out of that to the convection zone, you're in you're in the it, it drops down to the point where you reach the surface. You're only a few thousand degrees Kelvin. OK, so, so it's nuclear on the center radiating you know, where, where heat transports mostly by by ra radiation, um, the, the, the conduction, right, conducting heat. And then beyond that is a turbulent convection zone. Now, when you get stars that are that are massive. Um, and it's the model says it's several times the mass of the sun. The the opposite occurs in massive stars. What you have is a is a core. Okay. Um, let's talk about the stars that haven't gone through their 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 later phases. You got a core, and around the core you have convection, and and after the convection you have a radiative zone. So 
So for stars that are half the, the, the mass of our sun or less, you have a core and purely convection. Okay. Or between half and one and a half, you've got a core, radiation, conduction, and then convection. For stars that are greater than one and a half, you have a core with convection and then radiation. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why, for example, stars like Betelgeuse do odd things, and and stars, massive stars, do odd things because they're they're they they have a very very different environment, even if they're early enough to just be using hydrogen. Interesting. So, now you know, uh, let's uh, we probably should talk about Betelgeuse and what's happening. Oh yeah, because that's. Now, has that been continuing to dim, or has that dimming trailed off? I think you sent me something, and I wasn't sure if it was showing a trailing off of that dimming. Well, the most recent data that we have shows that the the, the star Betelgeuse actually has reached an, an equilibrium. Um, okay. It 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 is um, in in the case of of Betelgeuse, you know, by um, actually it was the measurements of as of February February seventeenth. Um, show that it, that star's brightness had remained constant for about ten days. Okay. Um, so it flattened out by so from from February seventh to February seventeenth, that period of time, the the star's brightness was 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 pretty constant. And between February seventeenth and today, I think the last ones were like twenty second. It shows a very slight, may show signs of a bright re- rebrightening again. Um, so we may have hit the bottom of the of the trough. Um, I mentioned that because a star's brightness is difficult to accurately measure on you know, inside our atmosphere. Right? Right. There are atmospheric constituencies and turbulent stuff that can cause it, you know, to, to complexities of dust and that sort of thing can make make precise photometric measurements um, uh, difficult. And stars that bright even stuff like the Hubble have trouble because it kind of overwhelms the, the, the Hubble sensor. If you've ever seen, you know, Hubble pictures with these stars, all these sort of patterns of flaring, right? Those are actually relatively faint stars overwhelming the, the sensitive detection. Something like Betelgeuse would just blind it right. you know, completely. So it's actually somewhat tricky. So what you have to do is do lots of measurements and do averaging and weighted averaging and so forth to try to get some, idea about that is one of the things i've noticed about a lot of the graphs plotting the the various measurements is that there's a fairly wide spread and you know these lines of fit that we're that we're drawing on them and things or you know we're also sometimes getting like a, a parabola best fit or something like that they're i mean obviously you have to do that to get like what is actually going on what's the trend but yeah I, i've noticed that while the trend is obvious it's it's not exactly the tidiest of data sets yeah and so and i think i understand is that that for massive stars, because they have this this sort of again because it's this odd thing of having a an interior convection cell, and we talk about we need to talk about convection cells in a bit, and this radiative zone outward. Um, massive stars tend to also be variable, right? That they have things where they'll get brighter, and the star will expand a bit, and then um, that causes the material to 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 move away from the core becomes less effective in its radiated properties and then the star begins, begins to cool and contract and so the star pulses it pulses in brightness okay now, Betelgeuse is known to have two brightness variables so it's known to be a variable star right and it has two um, brightnesses and, and and it's it's historically it's, its brightness has may gone between about 0.3 this is stellar magnitude and 1.2 so this 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 dip of of almost 1.6 is is kind of unprecedented, but it's not out of the screen ordinary. And given that that massive stars go through these, you know, there's probably what's supposed to called a convection cell realignment, but we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, Betelgeuse is known to have two um, variable periods. One is a 425 day period. So the main the main fluctuation we see in, in Betelgeuse's brightness, you know, things cycles on a 425 day period. There's another period that's roughly six years, again, due to internal forces. Okay. 
And, and so what we may be seeing is a combination of that 425 coinciding with a deep six year and possibly also one of these um, um, cell realignments. Sort of a perfect storm for star dimming, huh? Yes. So the 4.95 nine year cycle corresponding with the, with the 425 day cycle is could be part of why it's, it's there. Another possibility as well is that it it had a an ejection event where it it had an unusually massive solar eruption, and that that material may be moving out and dimming the star. Right, so it's left the surface dimming the star. Um, we might if that happens, we might be able to see light echoes of that but again we have to we have to 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 watch and see um so the 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 instead of the 0.5 to 1.5 variables is when you know magnitude changes went to 1.614 was i guess is a damn thing so it's not as if it's 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 it's, it's extinguished but um one thing also to realize is that that where convection we're talking about material that rises you know rises out of the hot core um reaches the equilibrium period and sinks back down. Mm -hmm. That convection is a process where there's as much stuff coming up as going down. Otherwise you get a hole right. <laughs> or, 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 or stuff would pile up, right? It's, it's so, so the convection zones are, are a combination of, you get these cells of material that, that up well reach the top and, and, and then move back down. So you get these, these cycles, these, these loops that are inside the star. Now it's a three dimensional, loop but but if you if you want to think about a simplified model of of a of a, of a plane um you might draw let's say six circles around a core that where you talk about the stuff that maybe is up willing and, and, and coming back down i'm as an example right but but because the star is also highly magnetic there's all these charged particles moving around, all the electrons and protons and so forth around there. You've got magnetic forces that are that are twisting the star up. Right, the star is not like a solid object like the like Earth, and so you'll get interior rotating at a different speed than the than the outside. And you'll get the 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 stuff near the poles rotating at a different speed than than the equator. So everything gets the magnet fields get all twisted up. It's part of how you get these magnetic knots that create sunspots. Okay. Um, where you get you get flares. And ironically, sunspots are spots where it's where the star cools. Right. Which is also where the magnetic field lines break and you get, get these eruptions. Um, the reason why it cools is because the energy is going into the the magnetic field and collapsing and, and, and being broken. So it, it 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 translates thermal energy into magnetic uh energy and so it actually will cool that's why that's why we see the dark spot um filters that, that look for light at a particular frequency will see effectively a sunspot because that particular wavelength is no longer being dominant so it appears to be darker uh, so back to the interior you can have let's let's say you have a star where you've got six convection zones, these little spots around here, and you, and the magnetic field is getting twisted up. You can get situations where all of a sudden a the the the, the cells kind of uh, move apart, and a seventh convection zone begins to develop. Okay, we go from a six lobe thing to a seven seven lobe thing that moves masses around and and creates all kinds of turbulence, which creates all kinds of 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 effects on the on the con the conductive radiation zone above it right so you could have something as simple as the the the, the cells get all twisted up and they and they reform with a different number of cells in in the interior and it it causes exhibit disturbances in the outer layers and so we should we could simply be seeing an effect of these of these variable cycles plus some internal structure that occurs inside and remember you know Betelgeuse is, is a huge star i mean it, it if if we took our sun and replaced it with Betelgeuse, it would go halfway out to jupiter so stuff in the interior that's moving around is takes a lot of time right for for, for stuff to move in that in that zone massive amounts of material are moving around in this turbulence this magnetically charged twisted um, turbulence set so it's not 
I would not expected that a massive star like Betelgeuse would go through some internal digestion problem. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we could see a combination of these fading things and an internal cell realignment um, that hit sort of a perfect storm of, of this sort of set. That being said, um, Betelgeuse is probably, it's, it's, we estimate its lifetime of being a normal shining star is it probably has at least 100,000 years before it goes supernova. Now, when it does go supernova, it'll be a nice bright star. It won't danger the earth because its poles are, are not pointing towards us. So we're, we're safe from that, but it'll actually be a spectacular event. It'll be bright enough that you'll be able to see Betelgeuse in the daytime okay. for, for a number of weeks. It'll be a pretty spectacular, you know, nighttime object, uh, perfectly safe to look at. Um, and, um, but, but again, we'll learn a lot about the death of, of a star that way. But one of the things is also that, that unlike, for example, with, with, um, with our sun, um, which goes from stars like our sun fuse hydrogen to form helium. And that does that for about 10 billion years and the uh, mass of our sun. And then at some point, the helium becomes the dominant material in the core. The star um, begins to collapse a bit. The pressure builds up, temperature builds up, and all of a sudden helium starts fusing. And when helium fuses, it 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 does it at a faster rate. And so the energy that of that faster reaction causes the sun to swell up. And so in the case of our star, the sun will span some 400 times um, its current size and, and its surface will get near where the Earth's orbiting now. Right. Well, not bad for the Earth. Um, and, it, but, but, but it will go and be fusing helium, but that lasts only maybe a hundred million years or so, or a couple of million years. And then um, it, it will shrink again, but it doesn't have enough mass to do the next cycle, which is um, fusing carbon. So the helium will end up producing carbon and you'll get this carbon lump that the, that the thing will shrink down to a white dwarf, nice and hot, bunch of carbon and uh, with you know other stuff inside of it, but right. most carbon in its core. But if you were more massive, that carbon would then use to form neon, for example, and then neon would go through a cycle of forming oxygen and then oxygen would form silicon and silicon would form iron and then it's all over. But, but that happens very fast. So take, for example, a star 20 times the mass of our sun. It will fuse hydrogen for only 8.1 million years. Not oh. 10 billion, but 8.1 million years. That's a really short amount of time in an astronomical sense. And then helium will, the helium phase will go over 1.2 million years. Again, it'll swell up even bigger. It'll have that helium flash and it'll swell up. Um, although it's different than the way our, our star does it. And then... And then carbon will fuse for about 976 years. And then neon will fuse for about seven months. <laughs> oxygen will be, because of its stuff, will also do that for maybe about one year or so. And then the silicon, sulfur silicon will probably last maybe a couple of days. And then when it goes, when it, when it starts to fuse and form iron, um, the star collapses in, in minutes. Okay. It breaks the so it's, it's kind of a, it's this, but, but when it's, when it gets to the massive star, like Betelgeuse gets to the point where you're, where you're trying to fuse iron, iron has a thing where, where it actually, it actually takes more energy to fuse than it produces. Right. Um, so no longer does the core generate energy. It's sucking energy in. And that's why the star falls in on itself. But 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 around that iron fusing core, you have like a silicon sulfur silicon fusion core. Around that, you have a shell of oxygen, neon, carbon, helium, and then outer things of hydrogen. Uh, unless the star is blown off its outer layers, in case it's even more weird. But the point is that 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 stars like Betelgeuse having internal digestion problems, nuclear digestion problems. That's that's sort of expected. We expect in its last hundred thousand years of its life it's going to go through various upheavals. And when it starts to reach the helium, it will, you know, so perhaps for example, we're seeing a, a, a change of 
helium fusing into carbon and that, that we're seeing slow, a slow change in mixture inside the core, which is causing the convection cells to become move faster and create different numbers, which causes the outer layers to, to be uh, radiative and get weird and so forth. Okay. So those are possibilities that we could see. So do we know if the star is currently past its hydrogen fusing days? Is that, do we know if that's done with or well? If it's switched over to uh, doing helium or something else, we, we, we suspect so. I mean, given our models, um, it it is probably gone into its to, to it's probably fusing helium at this point. Okay, but uh, but of course, the models are not necessarily reality, and so right. observing stars like Betelgeuse um, give us very valuable information about being able to help refine or refute models um that are there but but it's likely that that bilogies is going through that okay that so, process so while we might not be watching it you know get ready to go through its final stages we're seeing sort of the, the end of life saga of the star yes which is why it's 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 it's, it's it under it goes undergoes intense uh you know study and in fact the star is actually you know it's 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 actually quite large i mean it's 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 a big it's a big star it's about 11.6 times the mass of our star its radius is almost probably almost a thousand times the diameter of our star um it's over a hundred thousand times more luminous so it puts out lots of light it's a big big massive uh, uh, uh um star and again, its age is somewhere around eight to eight point half million years. And so, if it's in this last hundred million year cycle, it's it's probably in its its helium fusing days with a hydrogen fusion core around the helium fusion core, um, possibly. But again, these large stars have these various odd effects, and so some of the stuff that we apply to stars like the sun that's nearby that we can study don't hold well to some of the bigger stars right the way you want to study them that actually but those things are very important because that's how we get planets that reminds me of a, of a fun little thing so um this is a video game i like to play sometimes and one of the big reasons is it it is a it's set in a one-to-one -one scale milky way and all of the mm -hmm. stars at least close enough for us to have really good data about them are oh, presented with accurate sizes and star classes and whatnot and so um you can go to visit Betelgeuse if you want to. Yep. And so I did, and I remember at one point I turned away to start flying away from it. And I thought to myself, did I forget to actually, you know, engage my little fake faster than light drive? Cause I didn't see the star shrinking at all in my, you know, my rear view. And I was looked down, I'm like, nope, it says I'm going 18 C. It's just really, really big. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of mass in there. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, um. In fact, there's there's a a, a European space uh, mission called Gaia, G A I A. That's whose job it is to get very precise distance and velocity measurements of about one percent of the objects in in our in our galaxy, and it is producing the most accurate star map distributions, types, and so forth catalogs um, that we have, and and so from it we'll be able to build really good physical models of our entire galaxy. In fact, it's good enough that, that the dwarf galaxies, the large and small mansion like clouds, for example, are also being mapped in their motions. Oh, wow. So it's, it's not only very accurate in positions, but accurate in velocities. Now, this is, a, this is a telescope that's out in space, so it doesn't have Earth's atmosphere to create turbulence, um, that is very accurate, scanning the skies very accurately, knowing the positions over and over and over again. And so it's able even to see stars wobble due to perhaps unknown, you know, binary companions or even planets. So it's it's having also ability to see cases where a a planet passes in front of the star and it temporarily dips in brightness. And so it's able to discover planets that way as well. So, but but soon your your um, your 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 game will be able to have a data set that not only just gives you somewhat accurate nearby stars to most of the galaxy. Oh, and, wow. 
and seeing, because we're sort of beginning to see, for example, um, swarms of stars that are not quite aligned with the rest of the stars because our galaxy has been growing by what we call mergers and acquisitions. Small dwarf galaxies get absorbed by gravitationally bound and then, then and absorbed and into our galaxies. And we can see streams of stars from some of those um, previously absorbed dwarf galaxies still kind of swimming in in the the stream not quite going the same direction as the rest of the stars and so we can see populations of things oh we also are looking for the the what we call the brothers and sisters siblings of our star if the model of our of of how the sun formed is reasonably correct it probably formed in what's called an open cluster like the pleiades we look at the pleiades a uh, relatively young cluster of stars that are that are moving apart. You can still see some of the tenuous gas of the original cloud in between the the stars of the Pleiades. But nevertheless, um, it's a pile of loosely round stars. And so the assumption is that that our sun might have been formed in such an open group. And that's important because therefore. This, there are other stars that were formed about the same time, have about the same age as our sun. Moreover, right. they got stuck with the similar type of material that formed planets like our sun did. Okay. And so those would be good places to look for rocky planets, right? As an example. Makes sense. And in fact, those planets should be roughly the same age. So if they have an Earth that's an habitable Earth-like planet in in the in the zone that's not too hot, not too cold, there might be enough time to have interesting stuff occur. Biological stuff, maybe. Yes. And and we've we found, for example, just recently there was another um Earth-sized planet that is round a star. It's, it's a relatively cooler star uh, than, than our sun. And it orbits every 37 days. Um now every that you might say, well, that's that's pretty close to the star, but the star is not as hot as our sun. So it's it's a it's a it's a cooler star, but the zone it's orbiting in, even though it's closer to the star, is at the temperature where you'd have liquid water. Not boiling, not freezing. It's just in that nice Goldilocks middle. Uh, so um, there's a, there are going to be some uh, targets of the James Webb Telescope will be to look at planets like that, look at stars like that, have a have a um, a distant star shape, a little little umbrella like pattern um move in front of the star between where the telescope's looking at and the star so it'll, it'll block the star's light and the telescope will be able to image the planet that we know that's there we know it's orbital period and it'll be able to look when the planet is on the side so we will block the star and be able to directly image the planet and do things like what look at spectrum to see right. what kind of elements are in its what temperatures and elements are in the and if there's other planets around and moons and cool stuff like that that's really cool, cool. And we, so it, we do have ahead. a quick question from Walter. Can't we just shoot a torpedo into Beetle Geese, make it explode just for the show? I feel like the answer is no, but uh, I don't know. What do you think? Could we do that? Well, because it's, it takes a lot of energy to collapse that, that core. So, um, it's, not, it's not a matter of, of stars go bang because they fall in on themselves. They fall in themselves because their cores no longer hold up against gravity. Okay. Right. So and, a torpedo is probably not going to change that. Yeah, I mean, a torpedo would vaporize before it got to the surface. <laughs> <laughs> but but you go, even if you had some magic way to transport stuff into the middle and go boom, I mean, uh, you're having thousands and thousands of tons per second of hydrogen or helium being fused. Probably, probably much, I mean, I have to I calculate, but you have a massive amount of nuclear material going off. I mean, you have... You know, millions of hydrogen bombs per second going right. off there, and so you just say, "Well, I'm going to add another hydrogen bomb into it. It'll go sit there and go, yeah, yeah." It's it's a yeah. it's such a small yeah. fraction of what's already there. What you've got to do is you've got to get the core to stop fusing and or stop radiating energy. How do you do that? Well, it eventually, when it starts fusing iron, the it takes more energy to fuse than it gives off, and so the core will start doing that cooling, and so that convective zone um, around it will, will, will longer convect and the material will sink in. 
and then the radio zone will stop radiating and the thing will collapse in a few minutes to a, to a, and then all kinds of weird things happen, um, whether it forms a neutron star or more likely a black hole, other crazy things happen that time, but it's, it's not blowing it up that causes a star to go bang. It's the cooling it down. Now, okay. what happens? Well, well, part of when that star collapses on itself, um, you get weird things like, for example, um, it generates lots of neutrinos and an enormous amount of neutrinos that normally just pass through the star, but because the dense, because the amount of, of neutrinos that, that, that are generated at, at a short period of time, those neutrinos create pressure and, and help blow off the outer layers. Also the sound wave, when, when the star collapses, it's actually a sound wave, a shock wave that, that, that goes from the exterior to the interior. You get this, this, this crushing sound wave of, of un you know, unimaginable, you know, loudness that, that, I don't know. I was will, at a rock concert not that long ago. That will cause the deep interior, most likely to form a black hole, but it'll bounce off of that process. Cause, cause as, as the material, you know, the atoms, those nuclei hit together, mm -hmm. um, they, it'll, it'll, it'll stop. It'll, it'll slow down just a little bit as, as the nucleons are, are smashed together. And, and the electrons will be crushed into protons to create neutrons and it'll create all kinds of more neutrinos. But the outer layers that are, that are, that are outside will be blown off by the shockwave. The, the, the sound will bounce off of the core okay. as the core gets sh crushed into a black hole. And that shockwave backwards, that the, the bounce off of it will cause the outer layer to blow off at a good fraction of the speed of light. It's also where those pressures will create all kinds of crazy elements that form you and me and so forth. The stuff that isn't hydrogen and helium and right. so forth will, will get generated in a very short amount of time. And, and an enormous amount of, of, of light from gamma rays all the way to the X-ray, all the way to radio waves and so forth get, get off. So the interior gets crushed into something like a black hole or maybe a neutron star if it's, if it's, if it's not quite right or it isn't less massive than Betelgeuse. But the outer layer will be blown off at a starting with a good fraction of speed of light. And that's the shock wave that'll move out, hit some other gas cloud, cause it to create a lump. That lump will form a bunch of new stars. So the death of one star will create a whole bunch of opportunities for new stars and solar systems to form around it. All right. Cool. I want to say something. So um, I'm sure most of you know about Ben Hovind, No Relation. Uh, he is the lead guitar player for a band called Copper Magma, which, by the way, go to coppermagma.com. You can get their music for free. Um, but a lot of their uh, songs are themed on things to do with astronomy and astrophysics. Cool. And <laughs> Ben Tovind, you need to write a song about the collapse of a star into a black hole producing like the loudest sound in the universe or something. Yeah, you that, should definitely. That, that needs to that, be a song. <laughs> that 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 have a crescendo with a with a with a supernova bang, right? Yes. Um, they you have... build up to that. You know, have it go through its hydrogen and helium phases, and then faster and faster, and faster, and then the end have a yes, an enormous blow the speakers off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have to, to give an example. Like some of their songs are uh, "Black Hole," uh, "Heat Death," uh, "Copernicus" is an instrumental piece, but. Yeah, so um, they do have a, a song called "Black Hole," but does it does it involve the actual collapse with the loudest sound? And they also have one called "White Hole," which I believe is actually about the the Big yeah. Bang because there are some mathematical similarities between the hypothetical white hole and the Big Bang. Uh, so, so um, uh, one of the things as well is you know, so sound plays a a very significant role in the universe and how it how it evolves and in particular the early universe had it was 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 formed you know had a lot of the early structure of the universe was formed by sound waves again through a three-dimensional medium and pre-inflation the sound waves were were able to go you know um near speed of light across and so the universe was relatively uniform and when it went through this hyper expansion phase um it got to the point where um, it were expanded by, by enormous numbers of magnitude, um, got to the point where now parts of the universe could no longer, um, you know, uh, that, that, that the light takes to go across it would be faster than the, 
and stuff could reach. So, so you end up with, with really weird sound waves that are in the interior of, of the universe. Part of the sound waves that are or early sound waves, we think that they're, they're generated came from quantum fluctuations where quantum mechanics says, no, you didn't, you, everything can't be the same energy level, right? Everything can't right. be the same. There's going to be slight fluctuations and the slight fluctuations began these, these uh, sound waves moving through the, the plasma of the early universe. When we see the big bang flash, the microwave background, we see the harmonics of the, of that standing wave that was uh, those first standing waves was caused um, primarily when, when um, you know, in, in, in the first standing waves. And also, just like an in musical instrument, you have harmonics. So you had a primary wave that was going through the universe as the universe then stretched. And those waves were fairly short, but as the universe expanded and stretched, those wavelengths dropped. And, and we can see the harmonics of that first peak. And just like a musical instrument, it has overtones. And those, those overtones correspond to various nuclear processes. But, but just like a, a violin sounds very different than a, a tuba mm -hmm. because of the harmonics, right? Even right. though you might play the same note, the, the other overtones are different. Similarly with the universe, its harmonics are actually quite important and reveal what went on inside the early universe. So the ironic thing is that the primary tone, the primary resonance tone that came from the early universe is now very, very low. And so if you took a piano mm -hmm. and you found B flat next to the middle C, and then you went 71 octaves down, you would hear the current fundamental tone of the universe from the early days of the big bang just after the big bang that that early harmonic has now been stretched out 71 octaves below b flat so one thing i would i would recommend that melvin band might do is to build a song about the big bang in the key of b flat just well there you go and it just you say well it's, it's 71 octaves shifted transposed so you can hear it right because we're but, but also, humans have to hear it it's not it's not a song for elephants you know, there's, there's, there's the hydrogen went translucent 378,000 years after the Big Bang. Earlier than that, you had helium going translucent, helium forming. And so that's another peak. And then you have other harmonics in there. So you could look at the actual distribution of those, those harmonics we can see in the microwave and get the overtones and how you create the chord. But, but the fundamental tone in the universe right now is B flat, just 71 octaves. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go, Ben Hoven. We're giving you all sorts of sound ideas, song ideas. You got, you got to put a uh, special thanks to Landon Knoll on your next EP. Yeah. So, and um, which, by the way, do go check out the the website. They have some good music. I went to a show they played uh, Thursday, if I'm remembering my days of the week correctly. Yeah. So. Yep. And and just just to just to to make sure that that the uh, red eyes are common is correct. See, there's a chord. <laughs> Nice caught the brown thing. That's a, that's part of my uh, nice cork sitting stuff with a bottle over there. So I just opened oh. my first bottle in a while, and I realized I need a new corkscrew because the thing that I have is it's inadequate. Yeah, and so I need a, a nicer corkscrew if I'm going to keep getting wine. But um, I the next time I drink is going to be Tuesday for Kent with Bent. So if you, if anyone wants to see Kent with Bent, stay tuned for Tuesday. We're doing Kent with Bent. 17 dude where's my con man so that'll be cool but um all right so maybe we can uh let's do a couple things one is i'm gonna just broadly open it up to um questions from the audience so chat if you have any questions um just put them in the chat i will try to make sure that i read them in the order in which they are given, unless there is a super chat, in which case it will just be read as soon as I see it. Unless, so, you know, where there's obviously a question I'm already reading, in which case it'll be the next thing. So, um, you know, that's pretty standard rules. But, uh, and then I think another thing is, let's do some talk about something we already touched on a little bit, which is some, uh, some exoplanet stuff. Sure. 
So what are the main ways that we detect that? Because that seems like a really hard thing to find. Sure. Well, there's a couple of ways that, that we have a number of ways that, that there, but, but one of the primary ways that we detect is by um, now seeing a planet pass in front of the star. Um, a, 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 about, I think the number is, is around uh, a few tenths of a percent or maybe a tenth of a percent of the stars, you know, that have planets around them, have planets oriented such that the planet passes from our line of sight right in front of the star. Okay. And while that planet is in front of the star, the star's light dips, right? So, so basically, it's 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 it's, it's they're not close, they're not big enough to to eclipse and have the star go go out, but a few fraction of a percent of the star's surface will be blocked. And so the star will temporarily dip in brightness. Right. And then when the star, when the planet finishes transiting the sun, its star goes back up and you wait for one planet year to come back and you see the same dip again. And that's how you can sort of begin to, you know, and you do that. That's the standard is you do that for, for two of those planet years to see three dims and say, yeah, that's a, that's a planet. Okay. Another way is that you um, take into account the fact that um, the star and the planet orbit a common point between them. Now that point is typically deep inside the star. The star is much more massive than the planet, but the planet does tug the star just as the star tugs the planet. It's just that the planet's relatively light, so the star's motion relative to the planet is fairly small, but it's observable we can actually see the wavelength of light change because the star wobbles back and forth as if, if this this here's a star and here's a planet as the planet moves around the star also sort of chases it so it's so the star is doing this while the planet's circling okay so it's sort of a thing right to so say the planet's going to lift an orbit and the star is doing this sort of thing so that star wobbling back and forth will cause its light to to shift the doppler effect where the uh, you know frequency of light will begin to redshift and then blue shift and it'll move back and forth what at the rate of the of the planet moving around. The first um, planets that were discovered around other stars um, came about from this technique of watching the basically the spectral lines shift back and forth. The first planets that we detected were really massive multi Jupiter mass things that orbited close to a star, so their effect was fast and right they're sort of the easiest days, to find days weeks and so forth so but but as we got better doing the transiting planets particularly with telescopes that are outside the atmosphere where again the brightness can be ac measured accurately you begin to see those 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 dips and so kepler was a mission that discovered you know several thousand planets that were then confirmed by independent observation there's a new thing called tess um transiting the NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite has been operating, and it already has a, a catalog of around 1,100 candidates. So when we see a star dimming, because let's say a planet going in front, but there's other, there's other techniques. We actually have a couple of planets have been directly observed. Um, Which is really we, cool. Yeah. And, um, but when, when the, the dimming spot, you have to be careful because it's possible that what you're seeing is a giant sunspot and the star rotating. Right. Right. And so you have to do other things to try to verify the fact that, that um, what you're not being fooled by is some, some, you know, sunspot on the surface or the star is variable. Right? the star, remember we talked about variable stars. Well, you might have a star that's more cataclysmic where it has certain dims. It's not a sawtooth back and forth, but it goes along and all of a sudden has this, has this blip and comes back down. You have to be careful you're not being fooled by those sorts of things. So um, the from the, the TESS, again, it's the Net Terrestrial Exoplanet Survey Satellite, has 1,100 planets, and so far, 37 of those have been able to have follow-up observations through other techniques to confirm that they're, in fact, um, you know, a, a, a planets. Right. So you just don't have a single... You don't have just a single observation say, hey, there's a planet. You have to have independent confirmation. So, um, but one of them in particular that's been confirmed is this uh, planet. Because we also then, because of 
knowing the mass of the star, you can calculate the mass of the planet due to you know, simple Newtonian uh, mechanics. And this, this planet circles a, a star about every 37 days. And it's, again, the mass of the planet is roughly Earth-like in mass. So it's unlikely to be a giant gas bag like, like Jupiter, more, more likely a rocky planet. And the temperature next to the star is such that water could be a liquid form, not boiling, not freezing, but kind of in that nice Goldilocks zone. So it's a nice, it's a nice early result of an Earth-like planet with a nice Earth-like temperature zone. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, so we do have a question from Jens van Brokhoven, one of my wonderful patrons, by the way. Uh, if you do want to support the channel, there are links to do so in the description, as well as I put in uh, links to several of the websites that you usually uh, plug land in. So I think like uh, Pimp Monk's Twitter is in there, and there's a few other things in there. So I remembered from last time to do that. But anyway, the question is, what is a recommended camera slash scope for beginners? Um, I would, one of the things I would do is, is, well, first of all, one of the things that, that, that you should not overlook is the use of binoculars. Um, a good binocular, particularly even a binocular is with image stabilization where you can press a button and the image is, is, is stabilized. You can see a lot of detail with those sorts of, of, of tell us, you know, binoculars. Um, so don't under, underestimate, uh, binoculars. There is also a, a really good, um, uh, so a couple of really good articles by, uh, that, that are, they're one by Sky and Telescope, one by Orion Telescopes, one by Celestron that I would, uh, I would recommend. Let me put into, um, our, uh, let's, let me do this in the chat so you can transfer it over there to there. Here's a link, okay. um, to my page. And it's called astronomy interest and you'll see as a first section will be stargazing observing basics but the next section is choosing a telescope and on sky and telescope is a really good article oh. how to choose a beginning telescope video by orion telescope i would recommend doing it which is best for beginners again orion telescopes are pretty good and they sell good 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 stuff so um best yeah there's a thing about kids and what's the best for that how to buy from Celestron, another um, uh, good video. I would encourage you to look at those 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 things because Sky and Telescope, Reputable Magazine, in fact, is a magazine of the American Astronomical Society. Orion Telescopes are are, are great dealers. Uh, highly recommend their bid. And and you can you know watch the video and give them a call. They'd love to talk with you and uh, and sort of figure out you know help you guide you based on your budget based on your age or who's involved um, as a little kid to seniors so forth to guide you into stuff as well as to make sure that you understand what is you're getting. Um, you don't, you're not going to get the Hubble telescope. So <laughs> no the Hubble like pictures, but um, don't underestimate the power of using your eyes to, to see something. I had a, um, a good friend of mine in Australia, uh, and we used his dad's binoculars. And I said, "Well, you know, here's Belter Ryan. Go and look at that sword there, and and look at that middle side. And he looked there, and he saw the Orion Nebula, yeah, right? with his own eyes, right? And that was like way cool for him. Now, again, it's not the nice, pretty picture you might see in an Australian magazine, but he saw it with his own eyes. Right? Those That's are cool. photons going from that nebula straight into your eyes. That's a yeah. that." There's something different there, and um, I'll say that from personal experience. You're not going to get, even with a, a telescope far bigger than you could ever afford. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I looked through a telescope that I believe was several million dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the biggest telescope I've ever looked through. Even with that, you're not getting the Hubble telescope if it's based on Earth. However, there is something really cool about realizing that, you know, there are photons streaming into your eyes that started their journey you know, tens of thousands of light years away in some nebula somewhere. Yeah. And it's, and yeah, there's nothing like that. And that's, you know, drifting across, uh, you know, something I like to do is just to take, you know, we have a, um, um, a 0.8 meter telescope here to help build and 
occasionally when I do some some project, I have some some research project. Um, it involves getting stuff set up and then waiting for something to rise late at night. And so while I'm waiting for it, I just take the telescope and point it at a random spot in the sky and start start moving around um, and and just watching stuff, right? And uh, there's an amazing amount of stuff to see out there. You're not going to run out. Of, you're yeah. <laughs> you're run out of time before you run out of stuff to see. And uh, again, um, I mean, certainly one of the things that's important for a telescope is its light gathering power, because pretty soon you might say, you know, seeing the moon, Saturn, Uranus, Jupiter, you know, Mars, those things. No, that, that's nice to see, but, but, and then the, the brighter nebula, but pretty soon you need to see some of the fainter stuff in order to be able to, to, to see things. Also, you need some, you need a, a, a by larger telescope to help with a you know, bigger mirror, a bigger lens because you, it, that will make stuff appear brighter. In particular, if you want to see color, your your color receptor, your eyes are not as sensitive as your black and whites. Right. So if you want to see some color, more color, you need to get some aperture. The problem, of course, is typically as you get a bigger and bigger mirror, bigger and bigger lens, your field of view becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So, you know, in, in, in our case, so the 0.8 meter, given it's, optics is focally uh, about 5.8 meters 5.7 meters um we could barely fit the full moon in its lowest magnification yeah so by the time you get to be really huge telescopes you're seeing it's just a small speck of stuff so you want to look at something as beautiful as orion the, the, the to me uh, 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 as orion nebula you need wide angle if you want to look at something like Andromeda, which is actually a couple of degrees in size, you need a binoculars, right? So binoculars with big, big lenses can give you some views that big telescopes can't because big telescopes are just seeing tiny little points yeah. in the sky. Well, and one thing I will say is um, if after a beginning stage, you want to get into something like some tracking and astrophotography where you can track an object for a 30 second or a minute and a half exposure or something, you can also do some pretty impressive stuff that way where um, it's not going to be going straight into your eyes, but you can accumulate light over the course of, say, 60 seconds and get uh, a brighter image than you would in real time. So yeah. that, that is also something to, to look into if you want to produce things that you can, you know, have like in a photo album or I guess people don't have photo albums anymore. What do they have now? Yeah. Your Instagram feed or something? I don't sure, know. Or that or, yeah. <laughs> But, but, but yes, that's so, so yes. And by the way, also, there are also, um, now it's, again, it's not your photons that go in your eye, but there also are online telescopes you can also, um, use to as well to, uh, to look at things. But again, I think there's something special about seeing the photons. I also like, oh, yeah. um, I like refractors in that, you know, I'm not seeing large refractions, but refractors have their own sort of special thing. And so, um, one of the one of the best refractors that's actually still in use that you can use is the Lick 36 inch refractor. So it's a lens. Its its primary lenses are 36 inches across. These these are enormous. Second largest lenses of a telescope. The 40 inch refractor is now not really functional or not in a position of being functional because they're building us building a bunch of apartments around it. Um, but but Lick is still uh, the Lick 36 inch refractor is still um, a a quite a usable telescope and was, was made in the late 1800s. And it's a joy to see things like, you know, um, Saturn and so forth or, or, or globular clusters. Um, and so there is something to say about, about seeing photons with your own eye. Oh, I definitely agree. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a different experience than it is to see a photograph of something. And, and answer to Joseph Grant's thing about, uh, or was it Joseph Grant's? So no, somebody asked, a question about uh, a pineapple on pizza. No, that's trim. Yeah, trim to rest. Um, and 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 yes, um, I I think that there is a place for pineapple on certain types of pizzas. In fact, I had a really good in Australia a a a pizza that had you know barramundi and pineapple on it, which was actually pretty good. Okay, but those are the same people that will put beetroot on a on a hamburger. They they're more 
creative with her cuisine than see than most i'm more inclined to try beets on a hamburger than i am to be to, to be non-suspicious of pineapple on a pizza but then again yeah. i like beets a lot so maybe i'm just a weirdo that way but now, um yeah we have another right. question from tyler west uh it says how close are we to developing a theory of quantum gravity well i guess the question is it, it stems from the fact that that uh Relativity, um, dealing with the universe in the large scale, and quantum mechanics, dealing with the universe at a small scale, have problems where they kind of meet in the middle and meet at the extremes, such as near the event horizon of a black hole and other phenomena that occurred early on in a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang and other crazy events like that. The, the, um, the two theories on those extreme conditions don't mesh well. And so people have been trying to come up with a unifying theory that will handle all the conditions of general relativity that's very, 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 very well established at the big scale, given the scale of, you know, scale of the size of the preservable universe and quantum mechanics, which deal with the stuff down at the subatomic level, right? That, that is uh, getting those two to, to mix is a bit of a very big problem that, you know, as actually one of the things that, that Einstein, um, stopped, people don't realize that he stopped work on relativity, um, really early, early on and turned his attention to trying to unify the force and come up with this, 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 um, theory that would compass, encompass gravity and the, the, the nuclear forces. You know, it's ironic. You know, he, his, his Nobel prize was about the photoelectric effect, which is just, just, it was just, which is fundamental to quantum mechanics. Right. But he was trying, but he's well known for his stuff in relativity and gravity and, 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 and other amazing things like that. And he spent most of his his career trying to come up with a unified um, model of 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 both you know uh, what we call you know, quantum gravity. Um, he was unsuccessful. There's been some very very smart people that have worked on it. Um, people have various ideas, but some of those ideas are not at the point of testable. I mean, you could have a concept, but if you can't verify it or you can't, if you can't disprove it, it's not even a theory. So that's one of the problems about string, string models. Right. I don't call it string theory uh, because most string models are not currently testable. You need to be able to be refuted. You need, you need to make a prediction that you could measure that if it fails, you toss out your, your model. Now, for these solutions, does it look like they're on track that we could be testing some of them at some point, perhaps with larger... Well, there's, hope. there's hope there. So I'm not saying that that string modeling and, and string mathematics is useless. It's a very important field. It's just not to the point of being able to develop a, a theory that's, that's, that's falsifiable, right? Yeah. So one might say, and it's a... You know, common. I think it was Polly who said it's not even wrong. Okay. String models right now are not even wrong, right? Meaning that you can't at this point to prove them. But 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 a lot of efforts going into trying to do that. There are other options besides string uh, that is, that are being looked at. But again, um, and some very bright people are continuing to work on it. I mean, <laughs> you can't you can't get more uh, you know, authoritative than someone like Einstein um, who spent decades working away at it. But of course, um, we know a lot more, you know, post Einstein than Einstein did. Um, so perhaps the combination of observations, other theorists and, and so forth will eventually lead, read a result. But, um, as I say, it's not, we're not there yet. It is an important, it's an important process. Uh, if you think about the fundamental forces, According to the standard model, electromagnetism, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and gravity, we have a fairly unified model of electromagnetism, strong nuclear force, and weak nuclear forces. Gravity is kind of the odd thing out. And so coming up with a unified you know, subatomic physics model that includes gravity 
and is able to handle those near boundary conditions of black holes and is able to handle stuff at the scale of the observable universe and down to subatomic things inside the nucleus of an atom, um, that's a hard problem. And to have it go over extreme conditions from normal terrestrial temperatures to near absolute zero to trillions of degrees Kelvin is extraordinarily hard. Um, so uh, people are working on it. Do we have something that's Tesla right now? No. Might we? Well, you know, it's hard to say. Um, I hope so. Okay. Uh, we have a question from TD Lane, and this involves perhaps not your favorite universe. But... <laughs> yeah, this is my favorite universe, just, but just, just he... to be on the record. <laughs> he says, what's the most egregious disregard of physics in science fiction in Landon, Landon's opinion? And then I will think of mine while you're giving your answer, because I'd like to answer that too. Yeah, so, so you have to pick your science fiction poison, if you will. Um, it, now, I understand when I go to a, a let's say, a Star Trek movie, mm -hmm. I don't go to Star Trek movie to see physics. I go for well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, because you'd be disappointed <laughs> if you went to, if you went yeah. for physics. Any kind of killjoy in this. That being said, you know, um, and, and there are, by the way, people who say, well, if you could go past me to light, blah, 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 right? And, and, and the physics of warp drive, given that, it, that it's possible, right? Is, is there's some interesting stuff you can do with that marriage. But the question about what, what happens, um, there are several sort of egregious things. Now it's hard to quantify saying, well, that's, that's egregious to 0.7, but that's 1.6 egregious, <laughs> egregiousness. Um, uh, so I think one of the cringe things that I see um, is assuming that, uh, you know, I guess it gets the misinterpretation of what is a light year, right? Um, and, and, you know, there's a famous thing in Star Wars about doing the Kessel Run and... Oh, and a certain number of parsecs, which is yeah. a distance, right? Distance stuff, right? Um, and, and of course, the Star Wars fans have various ways of, of excusing that sort of thing. But, but they, they tried I, to fix that in the, uh, the solo movie. I don't know if you saw that one. Oh, how did they try to fix that? So their excuse, which had already been suggested in other Star Wars media, was that in order to get away from Kessel, you had to pass through this cluster of black holes. And you <laughs> could shave off time by getting closer to the black holes and taking a shorter route. But it was more dangerous. And so what, in fact, Han Solo did was he took a very unusually short route right through the center of these black holes with careful piloting skills. And so that's why he, he was giving a distance, because the Kessel Run has a variable distance, depending on how close you want to skirt around these black holes. But, but, the, but the, the time of context of that movie... Oh, yeah. It, I know it, it well for, for other reasons we would not go into, was, was implying that this is how fast... The, the the craft was oh yeah because it was an answer to like you know, it, you know is it a fast ship he's like oh you never heard about the ship that made the kessel run in whatever parsecs it still doesn't really make sense but it was an attempt yeah so so that's one of the I guess one of the the egregious things I mean I, I give you give your next one and I'll, I'll go back and give another one okay there's another there's another Disney so I, I one of my big ones is that in movies um, less so in books but especially in movies or TV. Gravity is either on or off. <laughs> yeah. So, like, um, if you watch, if you watch the Expanse, which generally I think is actually pretty good on the science, a lot of the, the mm -hmm. orbital mechanics work and stuff. And sure, the engines are made out of pure efficiency, mm -hmm. but but one of the things is they're on all these different uh, bodies. Like sometimes there's scenes on Ganymede, or there are scenes in uh, you know. They're uh, at Mars gravity because either they're on Mars or on the, yep. they're on a ship that's accelerating at that rate. And yeah, everyone just acts like gravity is either on or off. It's either zero yeah. G or one G, even though in the show, they'll state that they're going at point three. They're, they're accelerating at a point G three G. But that everyone walks normally, things fall at nine point eight meters per second squared. Yeah, everything is just on or off. Well, it's ricochet off stuff. Yeah, that that sort of thing. So that's 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 uh, that's one of my um. Yeah. um now another one I think that, that's egregious is the notion of of explosions in space, right? 
Okay. Um, the sound things, right? The, the Star Wars uh -huh. in particular egregious at this, but also you get some in the Star Trek as well of, of notion of something going bang and they gotta they gotta give you visual stuff. <laughs> if, if if you watched a a a ship blow up without sound, it wouldn't have that Hollywood punch. So right. so that that you know in you know in space, someone can hear you scream. Well, if you have a microphone and you transmit the things you could hear it but 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 it doesn't stuff doesn't really pass through space uh, that well space right. is a very very tenuous vacuum and so sound waves don't really travel well i definitely agree with that one um yeah the only thing one for you so one of the ones this is actually going to be pretty specific but there is an episode of star trek voyager in which the, the titular ship voyager falls into a black hole and manages to escape through a quote crack in the event horizon. Yeah, yeah. But the event horizon that's... isn't an object; it's a mathematically determined like radius that you can't crack. That. Yes, yes. And in fact, uh, I would come back to say I was going to say the same thing. Um, the black hole. One of the, I guess, Hollywood and and Disney is particularly egregious of thinking that black holes are these vacuum sucking things that just suck everything in, right? Oh yeah. And so. And so, uh, you know, uh, Disney's black hole movie, Return of Black Hole, you know, gives people the notion that black holes sometimes this this cosmic whirlpool going down the drain. Type of thing. <laughs> um, and it's not quite that that it's actually that's no right. Right. <laughs> from a sufficient no, that's not. from a sufficient distance, it'll be like any other source of gravity. And, and it gives the so you say, well, what's the harm of this? Actually, you know, if it's telling a good story. And you could debate whether Journey to Black Hole was a good story or not. I, I, I had fun as a kid I, watching it, but then again, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but still, uh, I think the thing that you have to say is, well, does it give the public a, a fundamental misunderstanding? And and here being, here's the thing that I think is is there. It took a long time before you can we were able to, you know scientists were able to convince. Hollywood to depict a a black hole and how it looks right and I think it was was it was it um what's it I think the movie Interstellar was, it, was that I what think it was, was it was Interstellar right that showed the 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 ring and the and the line in front of it and the the back yeah stuff of, of seeing the backside and, and and all the twisted bits um and there was there was objection from you know. Producer sort of like people saying, "Well, but that's not what the the, the audience expects," and and they managed to prevail and say, "No, let's actually do the mathematics because yeah, when you when you have first of all, you don't see a black hole; you see a shadow that the black hole casts from what there is this disk of material around. If this is the black hole of horizon, let's say, it's, and, and somewhere inside is the is the is the dense nub of stuff." Right. But this is the black hole of end horizon. Out here is a area zone where where material is 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 orbiting, mm -hmm. orbiting quite fast. In fact, if you take this one, if this event horizon is is distance of one, and let's say this black hole is not not rotating, then out at a distance of three, you have a very stable orbit. Something right. beyond three distances of this will be able to orbit this black hole. Forever, it's not going to fall in. It's not going to. Its, its orbit isn't going to decay. It's it's a it's it's a nice still orbit, and and due to gravitational collapse, this cloud basically collapses like a pancake. The reason why uh, rotating material in the form of disks is and not a sphere is that the 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 disk collapses by gravitational. One of the things one of the models is by gravitational attraction, and central forces for it can out, whereas gravity pancakes it. So that pizza dough that you're spinning to build the pizza pie and you, you sort of spin it sort of flattens out. Part of that is, is centrifugal forces. Part of it is gravity flattening. Right. So around a black hole, you're going to get this disk of material. Now that, that material, even if it's in stable orbit, it's got, it's got undergoing enormous, you know, uh, 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 you know dis disturbance, right? It's a really messed up space-time zone. It's it's moving at high velocity. It's banging the things, and so it actually is quite a high temperature zone, and it radiates a lot of of energy. Now, the energy that goes toward the black hole we don't see. 
the energy that goes away from black hole gets disrupted by the material, other material of orbiting. Right. But the material that goes to the side, right? So if this is the if this is the pole, the material that goes this way and this way actually escapes. Right, because it gets and, bent around. Too. And in fact, if if the if the orbit of the black hole or the the poles of the black hole are like this, what you'll have is a ring around it that's radiating towards you. And so when when that's actually pointed towards the Earth, we see something called a quasar, a very very bright object. Right. Um, so so. But 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 if it's if it's on the side, when when the when that ring passes in front of it, you see that bright line. When the ring comes behind it, um, what happens is the light that comes this way goes over the the black hole and, and goes towards it. So when you see when you look not at the black hole but to the side, your line of vision gets warped around so you're seeing the 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 back side. Right. So that's why you see in, in these rings is you'll see this kind of this glowing ring around a central shadow with a line going in front of it. The line is the stuff in the front of the of the black hole, and the ring is the stuff behind that you're seeing around on the back side. But most people want to see a, a whirlpool and, and until they get the notion. If for some reason you took you're able to crush the sun down to a density where it formed a black hole. The Earth would still orbit, yeah, like it does before. Might get cold, so, right? We get cold. We didn't. We wouldn't see, wouldn't see any light anymore. But but the positions of planets wouldn't just all of a sudden fall in. Right. The only thing that makes a black hole is density. Right. Right. So so that's one of the things that I think that 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 Hollywood tends to get wrong. But they're getting right more in time is is the notion of what a black hole is and what it looks like. Well, I I'm hoping that that movie was popular enough to update the general public's idea of what a black hole should look like. And I think yep. also the uh, the recent picture that was resolved out of all those other telescopes, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that will help too because it lines up reasonably well with things like that movie. Yeah. And, so, that, and, that, and that, by the way, that, that picture again was the glowing material that the, that the, the collection of, of radio telescopes were able to um, detect right. was the material orbiting the uh the black hole and and because it's going at tremendous speeds and highly distorted it's high temperature so it's glowing at at, at x-rays and, and as well as as down in the radio waves the, the 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 dot you see in the center of it is the shadow that the black hole is casting that's not the black hole the black hole is smaller than the shadow in fact much smaller it it, it it's really showing you the the extent which still orbits around the black hole are permitted so in fact, the actual shadow is probably um, another. We think another thirty to forty percent smaller. Um, that would be event horizon, and then inside that would be the the actual object itself. Okay, we have a question from Virilian who asks: uh, Are you excited about rovers to Venus or Mercury? Yes, um, particularly Venus. Um, the same. Venus. Venus is. Uh, well, it's a difficult place to rove. Uh, <laughs> the only people who have been able to do that are, are the Russians, the former Soviet Union. Um, they they had a a program that it's not well known by by Americans. Particularly at the time it was being done, um, we had just landed man on the moon, and it was considered unpatriotic to talk about what the Soviet Union was doing, but. But Russia is a very competent country in terms of its its ability to to move stuff in space. I mean, um, people like Ian Musk get all excited about doing stuff that the Russians been doing for decades, right? <laughs> it's not, right. It's not, and 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 so um, the the one thing that particularly the Russians did was had a pro series of landers um, that that were able to land on the surface of Venus. Some of them successfully, rather than space planning, and then some of them were able to operate long enough to have a few pictures on the surface of, of Venus. And so, what we know about the surface came from those um, those uh, Russian Venus landers. Now, part of the problem is that down to the surface of Venus is is pretty hellish. Um, it's very very high temperature. In fact, the the 
highest surface temperature of, of any planet is not Mercury, close to the sun, but on Venus. Right. Venus also atmosphere is enormous, you know, enormous pressures. I mean, it's like 100 times or so um, Earth's atmospheric pressure. So it's a really, really thick atmosphere. That's why we can't see the surface. We just see the clouds around it. And the other thing is that it's full of all kinds of nasty acidic stuff. So high temperature, acidic, high pressure stuff. I mean, they, the, the best, I think the best that we had, a, they had a rover exist was like two hours. And that was part because they took, um, they made a, um, a lens out of a diamond. They took, I think, one of the diamonds out of the czar's crown and crafted it into a lens. Okay. Um, a non-trivial sized diamond, right? Um, so imagine taking the crown jewels from the queen and saying, we'll do something more useful than you, you pretend to be born by God to rule. Well, that's, and we'll make it into a lens. That's and easier if, it, if you're the explicitly anti-monarchist, monarchistic, uh, <laughs> Soviet union, than it would be for yeah. say Isa. But, 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 but why they did a diamond because diamond was actually fairly resistive to the atmospheric, uh, uh, stuff of, of, of Venus's atmosphere and, you know, the, of the, of the, of the acid stuff. But again, um, the spacecraft kind of heats up and melts. Well, we know a lot more about materials nowadays. We know a lot more about how to shed heat. The Parker space probe, for example, is currently orbiting the sun and it swooped in last its last pass, um, swooped in about 24 million kilometers, about 20, 15 million miles from the surface. So it's, it was about half the, mercury distance um or about three times 35 times the sun's diameter it's going to get closer and closer but this 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 probe is able to handle very very high temperatures because it's got this shade in front of it and this heat shield and radiating fin so we've gotten really good at shedding heat yeah we also have ceramics now that can withstand very high temperatures the the goal of this of, of, of a venus lander is to have a rover be able to to, to survive entry on on Venus, so you got to go through a really thick atmosphere and not burn up, mm -hmm. and you got to not and you got to land on a, a planet that has you know eighty percent of Earth's gravity, so it's a non trivial amount of, of, of gravity stuff there, um, and then you got to move around and having normal copper windings of a normal motor ain't gonna cut it in the Venus atmosphere systems, but uh, Los Alamos has been working with. Um, uh, Kaluga, which is a, the the place where uh, sort of the Cosmologics Museum of Russia and some of their their uh, top uh, rover scientists, and they've been trying to get some collaboration to, to, and they've been doing some environmental chamber tests to have things like motors operating in a high pressure, high temperature, acidic environment, and are getting some success for for that. Well, that's really cool. And in looking at having an energy system where instead of having a nuclear battery to keep it warm, you have an energy system to cool it. Right. And, and, and so the hope is that uh, they think they can build a Rover that can last for weeks on the surface of, of Venus and crawl around and do samples like they do on Mars. That would be really cool. So I'm excited about, I think about, about that. Yeah. If I remember, I think, um, I was reading up on the, the Soviet missions and basically the only thing that seemed easy about them was basically if you could survive initial entry into the atmosphere, it was thick enough that your terminal velocity would be slow enough that the tank like yes. landers could just kind of crash. Yes. And they're like, there was something like they, they crashed at about like 50 miles an hour, which they were built to withstand. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, I guess there's that. You don't need to pack a chute. <laughs> you just slam into the ground. I, I don't know if they had to add chutes or they tried that, but but again, it, it, it's a difficult process. But we now have a lot of experience with um, like the Kevlar balls yeah. landing on Mars, where where essentially the, 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 the spacecraft, one of the most is, is the spacecraft comes in, it fires retro rockets and slow down as best as it can. And they basically has these airbags Balloons that puff up all around it, so it turns into this big puffy ball that goes bounce, 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 bounce until the bags deflate and it hopefully is right up. Um, well, actually, they don't. It didn't have to land right up because they made it a, a tetrahedron. So when it unfolded, yeah. it was strong enough that even if it landed on its side, 
the base of the tetrahedron would still be, you know, on sure. the ba- on the bottom. That was one of the the more clever bits was they were like, we'll just make sure it unfolds the right way no matter what way it lands. Although I think they said it they think it did land on its bottom, if you will. Yeah, but but um the so so they had some really good successes of um and it's called Venera, um, V-E-N-E-R-A. Look up the Venera missions. Yeah. And um, there, there you'll show a whole bunch of probes of what happened to them. Um, you'll see some pictures. Uh, I, can, I can put this. There's a good, there's actually a relatively accurate Wikipedia article. You can post that in there. They talk about the, 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 the probes that were launched and the ones that failed and the ones they succeeded and some of the pictures that they had from the surface and so forth. It was a, it was a program that started in 61. Um, and it, it, the last, uh, thing was in 85. Oh, and before anyone asks, yes, there is an etymological relationship between that word and the word venereal in, as in venereal disease. And Venus. Yes. Because venereal diseases are the diseases that you get from the goddess of love. There you go. Yes. yes. And Venus so, is the Roman goddess of love. So anyway, there there is there are um, you know work going in feasibility studies right now for a uh, a Venus lander and Venus rovers, and it's going to be the next decadal survey. Every ten years, the astronomy community gets together and establishes a list of priorities for you know research and uh because you can only found you know there's there's, there's a there's a huge universe and you only have so much finite amount of money right right very it's very small amount of money so there's gonna be an argument about let's go to venus and explore the surface of venus as well as going to mars um so i'm hoping i'm hopeful that that the that the so they, you know, they NASA has approved, and Los Alamos has been working on proof of concepts to saying yes, it's possible that if we get a lander on Venus, given material science, we could have it operate for a non trivial amount of time. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would be more interested in that than Mercury. I think for one thing, uh, Venus has features like it has a very young surface. It seems uh, it's definitely got more interesting chemistry going on. Mercury is, is, it just kind of seems like a big ball of rock. And, and, and a small ball of yeah, rock, really. A big ball of ball metallic. You know, more, it's more like a metallic core of a planet. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of, cool. It's kind of tiny. Also, it takes a long time to get to Mercury. Um, reason being is that Mercury is relatively, you know, its mass is, 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 is pretty puny, right? It's not yeah. a, it's, Mercury is not a, is not a big, uh, big planet. So it means if you want to have a probe orbit Mercury and then land, you've got to go very slowly because yeah. Mercury is not doesn't have Mercury does not have the uh, the mass necessary to to, to 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 slow you down. Right, and just just capturing into orbit is going to take a lot of fuel because you're going to have so, to slow down enough. Yeah, uh, and and so it's 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 I mean it's it's surface of gravity is 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 only about you know point point four of that of, of Earth, um, and the other thing is of course is that you you've got to go slow because if you you know you're heading down towards the sun, and you don't want to fall into the sun, so you end up having to go there <laughs> gently and and you got to, but also you got to speed up to go to, to catch up with Mercury, but but at the, the a point it get 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 it slow because you can't you don't want to use a lot of fuel to try to break and then get captured by Mercury going to orbit and then land. Right. Um, whereas Venus is more, it's much more um, Earth-like in its, its, um, its, its, its mass, right? In, in terms of, of, you're talking about in terms of, of its, its surface gravity, right? It's nine tenths surface gravity. So at 0.9 G. So you would, you would have a little bit more spring in your step, but if you were able to walk on Venus without being, killed by the acid and the, and the temperature um you'd find you just be kind of little springy steps not not anything too uh too bad uh but but as i say it's 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 so it's it's a similar 
in size of the Earth. It also has, you know, so so we would learn a lot more because Venus is more closely resembles Earth than Mars does. Yes, although I think the reason that Mars gets the attention is because one, it's easier to explore, and yes. two, if you think about the idea of building an outpost on the surface of a body, Mars is probably the one that if you once you have material there, it's the easiest to build such a thing on. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's why it's it's sort of the sexy planet in a way that yes. Venus often isn't in people's minds. Although there have actually been ideas for habitable outposts floating in the upper atmosphere that would be lighter than the air on Venus, which is a much easier thing to accomplish than lighter than air on Earth, yeah. and be above the clouds of sulfuric acid and things like that at around, like, say, a little bit less than an atmosphere of pressure. Yeah. So... Yeah. There are actually ideas for some kind of semi-permanent human habitable structures around Venus, but yes. I think people Whereas just Venus. You're not going to. You're, you're, but you're not going to be having. We're unlikely to have structures on the surface of Venus, right? And I think that people have this strong idea that well, if you're going to build something around another planet, it's just going to be on the surface. That's how you. That's how you build things. Now, I, I put into a link um, a picture of the uh, Venera 9 uh, lander image, one of the best images we have of what the surface of Vetus looks like. Oh, I'm seeing uh, that. So it's, it's in, it was done in 1975. And um, that's the, that basically was, it's, I mean, probably the most successful set of, of stuff. Can it bring that up? And it uh, was able to... Uh, Ascent rate of uh, seven meters per second when the landing lander touched down, and uh, you know they were able. They had a cooling system try to distribute the heat load, and it was able to um, last long enough to be able to re relay an image, which um, is already a pretty significant accomplishment on Venus, man. Yeah. And by uh, the way, it only lasted. I think like I think it lasted like two hours or something like that before it. We have a question oh. from Trim to Rask. Am I hearing Cloud City on Venus? Yeah, that is a... It's a physical yes. possibility. I'm not yes. saying it's feasible, but it's physically possible. I mean, higher up, the, the temperatures are more <laughs> the date. And yeah. um, you've got, you know, particularly near the surf, near the, near the cloud tops, you also have sunshine, right? That right. you could use. And it's not, you know... It's not extremely hot but you could get you could have something orbiting venus now problem is of course if you're you're trying to get for long term really long term civilization stuff going in towards the sun is not what you want to do because as the sun moves towards that 10 billion year mark and it goes it'll swell up and and its temperature will rise and so you want to be farther out from the sun than right into the sun but I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like there's a, a couple billion years or so in the middle there where it won't be as big a deal. <laughs> and uh, humans have a tendency to think on the scale of centuries. So I still think that there's some feasibility to a future scenario where there's a human habitation on Venus. Because, um, you know, people, when you think in ast astronomical scales, you think like, well, what's the point if something's only going to last 100 million years? But then you realize... I mean, humans haven't been around for even close to that long. So you could get a lot done as a human civilization in 100 million years. Yeah. So, you know. Um, but yeah, if we're talking long terms in terms of like, you know, humans surviving for a significant portion of, say, the, you know, the period of the universe where stars will exist, then mm -hmm. I think it's, I mean, you're ultimately you have to get out of the solar system. You have yeah. to become multi-stellar, interstellar as a species. But um, yeah, there are in fact some ideas for hypothetical habitations on Venus, but we are quickly approaching the two hour mark. So um, I will, if there's a one or two more quick questions, I will ask them. Otherwise I'm going to start. Yeah, we're, going to, we're going to lightning round. And by the way, yeah. don't forget to subscribe, uh, click that bell to get notifications yes. on right there. Uh, I assume you have some way that people could appreciate, express their appreciation for the work you do? I absolutely do. I have, uh, in the description of this video, you will find a link to my Patreon, my Amazon wishlist, and my Teespring store. Um, 
A dinosaur's got to eat. Yes, I, I do have to eat, actually. In fact, after this, I'm going to go prepare some food. It will probably take me hours, but I do slow cooking things. Anyway, um, yeah, so there are those. Also, um, I have linked on your behalf, I let's see, the In Time channel, uh, the Twitter handles for, for Milwaukee Atheist, Isaac Butterfield, and Pimp Bunk. Yep. Those were taken from a previous one. And if there's yeah. anything you'd like to add on to that. Also, friend of Jordy's, uh, he just did a really good uh, interview with uh, Rudd, who was a former Australian prime minister. Okay. So, but settling on Pluto, um, Trim asks, well, there is actually a proposal to return to Pluto and actually have, an, have something go into orbit and land on Charon. Um, Pluto and Charon are orbiting each other in a balance point in the middle. And the idea would be you'd put a lander on the other dwarf planet that that, 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 that Pluto and Charon are orbiting kind of like this. And and the idea would be that it would land on that surface and be able to look at Pluto um, and and do detailed mapping and and, and stuff. Well, that would be, that would be, that's a proposal to return. Um, there's also a similar proposal. It's also competing with a proposal to return back to um, Uranus and or Neptune or both. I, I want to see a lander on both Pluto and Charon that look at each other and they can wave at each other. Yeah, there you go. That so would be, that, would yes. be, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but part of the thing reason why you want to look at Pluto is Pluto has an atmosphere and we can watch the atmosphere freeze out. Pluto's orbit is such that, that right now you have still a tenuous gas in the atmosphere, but as it moves away from its lift orbit from the sun, its atmosphere will freeze out. So there'll be a period of time where basically the atmosphere snows nitrogen right. ice and, and then basically turns into basically a frost on the surface. And watching that that processes would be really uh, interesting. What about watching similar processes on, uh, say, Mars? Because during the local Martian winter, the polar ice caps their volume increases and it's predominantly atmospheric carbon dioxide that's simply deposited onto the permanent ice, uh, water ice caps. Yeah. And I think also that, that the, uh, if I know correctly, you don't have quite the dust problem you do in the polar regions, but it's colder and you have the frost problem. So I feel like it's not as cold as it would be on Pluto though. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That, that definitely is, is a crazy thing. I mean, yeah, for, for, for the Charon lander, you would you know need to have a nuclear battery and use probably something like um something like for example a a a plutonium uh or other a radioisotope yeah it's gonna battery. keep itself warm because the sun's Cause not gonna do it yeah the sun would sun would be basically this if you if you saw the sun from pluto it would be a bit brighter than the full moon but but not very impressive right I think that's actually another thing that sci-fi doesn't do a great job at is de depicting the the fact that the sun gets dimmer as you go away from it. And yeah. so if you were on, say, you know, like, I'll, I'll use the Expanse again because they're frequently on places like Ganymede or, um, you know, in, in Ceres or something like that. There would sure. be noticeably less not light during the daytime on those places. Exactly. And another thing is uh, you talk about with read this stuff is, is seeing... You know, a science fiction stuff where someone is looking at, they're they're visiting Jupiter, and you see a giant Jupiter and giant red spot, and you're sitting there saying, "No, no, no, you're being subjected to enormous amounts of radiation, right. high energy particles, and so forth." Uh, you're like, like, no. I mean, it's it is amazing that the the Juno space probe is able to withstand the extraordinarily intense radiation zone, um, and in fact. It's one of the reasons why you know, the Io is the most volcanic body we know of, yeah. Uh, because it's it's in this crazy zone of of, of high currents. I mean, there's there's, there's several trillion amperes of current flowing between Jupiter and Io. Right? Oh, so Io is it is a semiconductor moving through this enormous magnetic field. So the electric oh, universe Jupiter. guys were right all along, <laughs> as long as we and, keep ourselves to just Jupiter. And so those those those, those those volcanoes that spew up, like you know, all that that sulfur stuff. Those ions achieve escape velocity and then travel through the magnetic field and, and slam, and you get these high energy particles orbiting and 
and creating all kinds of radiation hazards. All so right. when you see the couple, they're sitting there and, and they're watching because, you know, it's like going by Jupiter and having this way of time. It's like, no, 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 you're just being radiated. Of course, <laughs> excuse, uh, there's always excuses, you can say. But yeah. you just set aside a little bit of astrophysics and say, okay, it's a pretty picture. It's and, the rule of cool is what it is. It's, and, and then it's they cool. also... They also use old Jupiter pictures where the red spot is really, really big and red, as opposed to what it looks like now. Right. Well, in, the, in future, the future, it will just in, we'll just say in the future it got bigger again, or something. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, like, you're always able to rationalize stuff. <laughs> um, that's that's one of the that's one of the, actually the nice things about about you know Star Trek is they they tend to try it and and become self-consistent. So I give them credit for that. Yeah. You know what? Maybe sometime we should do a stream where we just nitpick various sci-fi franchises for all their egregious science errors yes um i'm usually willing to hand wave away the the things that make the plot possible in the barest sense so like okay warp drive sure whatever that's fine i'll just take if it. you have a good storyline uh then a lot of stuff can be forgiven for entertainment values yeah if a storyline with some special effects you can give them a bit more zazz but if all you have is special effects, mm. uh, sorry. I'm looking at you, some recent Star Wars movies. I know sometimes um, I, I have some viewers who will defend some of the more recent Star Wars movies. And they say blah, blah, blah is better than blah, blah, blah. But yes, yeah. um, I, I think I think from a science point of view, the the Star Trek franchises are have a lot more interest in science stuff. And in some ways... Um, the Star Trek universe has promoted science, right? And I think uh, yeah. space exploration did nods like having the, the the first sort of prototype shuttle being Enterprise. So there's there's lots of nods to to that mm -hmm. for that purpose, right? I think I think that 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 things like Star Trek inspire people um, to to think about science yeah. and their sciences. I mean, if you accept the premise of like warp drive, then some of the other minor things are are, are not so egregious. All right, well, we are hitting, uh, we were actually a bit past the two-hour mark, so I oh, think yeah. we're going to call it. We did get some positive response to the idea of just of doing a stream where we we talk about some of our complaints from sci-fi. So I might... Uh, we'll, and some more we'll compliments, too. We should, we, should oh, we, yeah, should, we, we should compliment the, right. the ones that are... So let's, let's uh, talk about that. Um, we'll send some messages back and forth on Twitter and whatnot. But, um, so yeah, channel news... Upcoming events. So Tuesday, uh, Kent with Bent seventeen, dude Excellent. who wears my con man. Uh, Thursday is the final episode of Creationism and the Big Bang. Mm. Saturday is um, the I'm releasing what I'm calling Genesis Apologetics should apologize the movie. It's a two hour plus long supercut of all my episodes of that series, without the filler bits that like the intro and outro stuff uh, in the middle. So all the intro outro bits have been cut out, but all of the the arguments on both sides are still in there. Um, and then the Tuesday after that should be the next Kent with Bent, which will be 18, yet to be titled. So uh, we have some title ideas. Uh, some of them came from one of my newer patrons, Al Rubel. So thank you very much for that. He suggested them in the patron only Discord, which you can get into if you're a patron. Yes. But Thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm going to the Python. Sorry you made it only towards the end. But hey, catch uh, Kent with Bent. And thank you very much, everyone who watched. Make sure you hit the like, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff. And all, all the good things in there. And again, I, I, I look forward to our, our talking about um, science fiction. I think particularly we should we should make it clear that science fiction does a lot for science. Oh, yes, absolutely. A lot for inspiring science. I don't want to be a dump on science fiction. I think science fiction, science owns a lot. Of, of gratitude towards science fiction yes. and so and so they get some stuff right too and the inspire stuff so uh, let's, let's have a let's have a science and science fiction uh thing the the good the bad and the ugly yes oh and happy birthday unidentified leviathan Apparently oh yes and, and and again and and uh, support people on there and of course uh you know continue to ask questions because that's what science is about science is about questions not necessarily answers all right well, uh, we will see you again. I will see you very soon. And we will be, uh, Len and I will be coordinated about when we are going to have our next hangout. We're still working on trying to make sure that these are usually every month. 
Um, you know, there's yeah. there's going to be the occasional time when it doesn't work out. But um, until next time, I'll see all of you guys later. Thanks for watching. Ciao.